Hi guys, welcome to Snakes and Adders. We're continuing our advanced series by today talking about the green anaconda or Eunectes murinus. This is the most heavy bodied snake in the world. It is going to be an absolute monster. This is a captive bred baby. They are still relatively hard to find. Most of the people that would keep green anacondas would still be working with imported animals. Even if you're lucky to get a captive bred animal, more than likely you'll be working with a F1 or F2 generation at the most. So these are native to Colombia, Venezuela, the Guianas, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia and Brazil. Most of the time these are collected from an area called Ianos which is in Guatemala. It's more accessible to humans and that's where most of the captive uh, green anacondas will occur from. The average adult size for a male is usually around 11 or 12 feet. A female, given time, may hit about 15 to 16 feet. In exceptional circumstances, yes, larger ones are available. To be honest, like because they're all collected from that area and it isn't in the thick of the rainforest, there may well be further giants lurking actually in the jungle itself. So they occur in swamps and marshes in the Amazon and Orinoco basins respectively. This leads to some complications with their captive husbandry in as much as they do like to wallow in water and obviously when large they're going to require a huge enclosure and usually a large portion of this is given over to a water area for your animal to bathe. They will actively soak. The problems coupled with this are that they tend to defecate in the water as well. When we're dealing with a large anaconda with a huge tank and a huge water container, it is simply unfeasible to try and remove this water container because it just weighs too much. So we're going to end up with some fetid snake shit stew, which is going to be horrible to try and work with. So more than likely in these big enclosures, you would probably have a filtration system. Uh, more than likely, I would probably recommend an external canister filter, which would be built into your custom built rig. Uh, and then also we would try and heat the water as well. You see the issue is we need a massive vivarium and we're going to try and provide a basking area of 31, 32 degrees Celsius, uh, probably an ambient of about 27, 28 and a cool end of about 26. Now that doesn't sound too hard to achieve but we're not talking about a 4 foot vivarium, we're talking about a 10 or 12 foot vivarium if not more and it's then the degradation of heat from the basking area, how we're going to get around maintaining ambient and cool end temperatures. These are truly equatorial, which means that you know there isn't a massive variance in their temperature range. And the issue we would have is that the water source would be remaining too cold um, and potentially the animals would catch a chill and develop a respiratory infection. So there may well be the need for a water heater built into your water container as well to maintain a water temperature of 24, 25 degrees minimum, really. Um, the other issue that you've got with green anacondas is, and it's a weird juxtaposition because you've got this marsh and swamp dwelling snake that loves to bathe, but when it comes out of the water it must be able to dry off. If it's not able to dry off, then there's the risk of fungal and blister type infections which will ruin the look of your snake and cause all sorts of problems. So it is important that the animal can dry off. The uh, humidity levels within the tank would probably be 65 to 85%. We would never want full air saturation simply because this then means that the animal, whether it's in the water or out on the land area, is permanently going to just be soaking wet and at which point this is where your blisters and problems are going to come from. They are problematic to get going as babies. I first learned of this litter which was produced in the UK about three and a half, four months ago and it's taken until this point where the breeder was actually happy to release the animals to me. Uh, they've been raised on a mix of chicks and mice and they're born with a big yolk sac from when they are uh, parted with, with, with their mother and they can spend three or four months not even wanting to feed properly. Feeding issues can become a bit of um, an ongoing thread with green anacondas in as much as prolonged fasting periods are relatively commonplace. Um, they don't always want to feed regularly. They may want to take different types of prey. Um, I've been told that one of the most successful diets was chicks and quail as they grew. Um, how much I subscribe to the usefulness of chicks is down to my personal preference. I asked for these to have been established on mice 
prior to um, me being able to uh, take them in. I don't really want to hand over any problems to the customers that would come and take these. So, why are they advanced? Well, for a start, they're huge. Two, they can't be trusted. <laughs> As you can see, that was almost on cue. I couldn't have asked for it to be any better. They will sit perfectly still. They will show so no signs of aggression. Other stuff like your retics and other animals, they will show you their antagonistic behaviours. They're going to S up. They might uh, raise their body, become rigid. The way that they move becomes an issue. I mean, these guys will just sit and there will be no sign that there's going to be a problem. And then all of a sudden, an explosion. And do not be fooled by this big, fat, dumpy body. These things are rapid if they decide that they're going to strike. They've got decent sized teeth. And even at this size, they're quite capable of drawing blood. And I'll be amazed if I can get through this video without being bitten. But you're keeping an advanced level snake. I don't give a shit whether it bites me or not because I'm handling an advanced level snake. This sort of stuff where we're worrying about temperament and everything else, that's for the beginners and the intermediates. You cannot consider keeping something as awesome as a green anaconda that potentially has some temperament issues or trustworthy issues. Um, you know, seriously, you can't seriously consider taking on something like this. This is advanced level. It's not play around stuff now. If it has yet, it has yet. It's just one of those things. And as an adult, really, you're never going to trust it fully. You might be able to work with it, get it to a point where you can handle it and work with it to a certain extent. But, you know, more than likely, this guy, before the end of this video, will have lunged again. Maybe have even got me. He's playing close attention to my face. It just is what it is. So as far as breeding goes, the gestation on green anacondas is longer than with standard boas. Generally, when we're working with the common boas, we work on a gestation period from ovulation to, um, like, pre-birth. Sorry. Oh. Yes, hello. Um, when we're working with the, the common boas, the post-ovulation shed to the date of partuition, which is birth, is generally accepted as being about 105 days. Whereas these guys, we're working with sort of a six month period. So, you know, the captive matings, which were recorded, I, I'm, I'm going to use data by Ross and Marzek, which is from the Reproductive Husbandry of Pythons and Boas. They've got a, the captive matings were April to June, and they were born from November to February. So that's, that's a, pr a pretty long um, uh, gestation period. Uh, it's going to take a lot out of your female, to be honest, um, you know, the breeding side if you're keeping this gear I'm not going to teach you how to suck eggs you know you know what you're doing um, when I looked up Manaus which is in Brazil heart of the rainforest the climograph for that that supports the information from Ross and Marzek uh, median temperatures throughout the day of 27 to 29 throughout the year so there is next to no cycling required and that's what they stated in the book and the dry season is June July August the wet season is February March April so yeah, that's all, that's all uh, as we go. What we've got to bear in mind with anacondas is they're not going to grow as quick as you would think. The retic keepers have kind of been spoiled in as much as you can buy a little string of a baby and uh, through hideous amounts of power feeding we will get them to 16 foot in three years. And actually they look more like anacondas than anacondas do, these big bloated huge breed of females in America that just look disgusting, nothing like a retic's supposed to look. An anaconda is going to require years of patience to get up to a good size. The female that produced these was four years old. She was only about 11 feet long. The male was probably about 10 feet long. So we're not talking about huge, monstrous, enormous animals where, you know, we're talking about 200 pounds in body weight and 17 foot long. That's going to take you 15 years plus to get up to that size because we have got to negotiate these fasting periods and everything else and it's tough you just kind of kind of roll with it they'll feed when they want to feed and when they are feeding they feed them good there was some comment made the other day <coughs> about feeding regime feeding regimen uh, it was regarding common boas how people feed them too regularly and all this sort of stuff the problem we've got with anacondas is we would probably put them on a weekly cycle because we don't know when the fasting period is going to come and it's that same sort of problem that we have with royals when they're feeding we feed them because we don't know when they're going to go off their food see something as reliable as a common boa that isn't really an issue and 
yes, they probably should be fed every three, three and a half weeks on a large meal and then allowed to digest it and grown on slowly so we don't develop this pinhead syndrome. Whereas with the anacondas, they're so hit and miss with their food. They don't particularly like change. They can stress out. So they are a bit a bit um, touchy when it comes to those sorts of things, changes in environment and etc. Uh, that when they're feeding, we're going to feed them well for just preparing for when that fasting period comes to make sure that there is adequate body weight and that they're going to be okay for this period while they're not feeding. I would grow them on as babies in rubs where the humidity is easily maintained, where we can get a, a, um, a water container in there. This is going to give us time to build our custom viv. We are not going to be dealing with some off-the-shelf vivarium here. You're going to be dealing with something that you're building into your house. It's going to take up a portion or whole room or whole shed or whole um, garage that, that, that you're going to convert for the purposes of keeping this animal. Nine out of ten people cannot offer a suitable home to a green anaconda when it's full grown, particularly a female. And this needs to be borne in mind. The theory and idea of green anaconda care is great. Keeping a green anaconda when it's full grown, when you have 150 litres of dirty water to clean out an animal that cannot be trusted and may still lunge at you even after four years of being with it, that will give you no clue that it's about to do it, precludes them from 90% of keepers. Um, and people might not like the idea that somebody's saying, well, you can't keep it. Well, tough. At some point, these snowflakes have got to know that this isn't just another snake. There are ticks, there's too many of them, uh, and people have got this false idea, this isn't a retic. This is more difficult to raise than a retic. It's more difficult to house than a retic. And serious consideration must be given to its long-term health, its enrichment within its environment. I mean, this snake just really doesn't lend itself to this rub tub, all its life gear. Uh, I mean, we're saying that retics don't, but the anacondas particularly, because these got got this prerequisite set of things that they need to make sure that they're, that they're happy and if you're going to have something as regal and awesome and breathtaking as an adult green anaconda let's set it up right let's let's really think about this more than likely there's going to be ceramic heat emitters which are going to be at the warm end there may even be a trough type ceramic heat emitter halfway such as uh, the ahs systems from microclimate which are going to try and help us maintain our ambient we may have to have filtrated water we may well have to have heated water um, and then we've got to try and keep it feeding, keep its skin in good condition, uh, make sure that we're not giving it a respiratory infection or anything else. We've got all of that cost. See, green anacondas aren't mega value. Like, this, these are £250. But the rig for your adult, I would, would not be surprised if it was north of £1,000 to set up properly. And that's being serious. So serious consideration needs to be given as to whether you have the space, the resources, the funds, the patience, um, the nuts to go in with a big one, especially if it stays stroppy throughout its life, they're not for everybody. And we've just got to be realistic at this point. Um, do your research if you're going to keep one. For Christ's sake, do not take this lightly. It's a serious undertaking. It is not to be uh, trifled with at all. They are fabulous snakes. If you get a tame one, they're great. I used to have a nine-foot male. He was as good as gold. I always kept my eye on him, um, but even he could be finicky with his food and he'd feed one week and then not the next. He was a, it could be a pain in the arse and you're potentially going to inherit a pain in the arse as well. So the Latin name is Eunectes Morinus. Um, make sure you research. We will keep the videos coming. Visit www.snakesandadders.co.uk to see what we're all about. Cheers.